Hello again, this is Professor Watts, and today we are going to talk about capital budgeting, how businesses decide what investment projects they are going to undertake. Let's jump in. The capital budgeting decision process has three basic steps. First, we have to come up with some investment ideas, projects A, B, and C. You know, and That might be expanding our own plant, launching a new product line, expanding into a new market area, acquiring a, another company, so on and so on and so forth. Review, analyze, select from the proposals that have been granted. Of course, we're trying to find the one that's going to make us the most money, and that's going to increase the value of our firm the most and lead to the biggest increase in equity values. We implement and monitor the proposals that have been selected. Of course, you have to make sure they're performing as predicted, and that's going to be one of the biggest problems in finance, going from the prediction to the actual performance. And note that this says here that managers separate investment and financing decisions. In terms of what projects we're going to undertake, that's the investment decision. And then how we're going to pay for them, how we're going to finance them, that's the financing decision. Because the investment opportunity stands or falls on its own, regardless of how you choose to pay for it. There are many capital budgeting decision techniques out there, but we're only going to look at uh, three of the biggest ones in this course. And those are the payback period. Most commonly used, most simple, but also kind of not too sophisticated and it has some drawbacks. Net present value, this is the probably most commonly used one, uh, the most financially sensible one, but also difficult to realistically calculate and somewhat difficult for the uninitiated in finance to understand. And then finally, the internal rate of return. It's actually a complementary concept to net present value, so they kind of go hand in hand. And this allows us to convert the net present value concept into a rate of return concept, which more people can intuitively understand. So whenever we use net present value, we're probably going to calculate internal rate of return right there along with it. So here's what the capital budgeting process should involve. First off, we want to account for the time value of money. Very, very important, as we've been talking about in the past several lectures. We want to account for the fact that present values are less than future values due to discounting. And future values are higher than present values due to compounding. Because when we think about time value, how do we accomplish that? Of course, using present value calculations discounted cash flow. Accounting for risk, we're going to factor risk in by the choice of the discount rate, R, in our present value calculation. Higher R for more risk, lower R for less risk. Focus on cash flow, so we estimate the incremental cash flows, which means period by period, and those will be involve both inflows, the money that the project generates, and the outflows, the money that we have to spend to create the project or uh, build the project. Rank competing projects appropriately. We'll rank them in order of either net present value or internal rate of return. And then utilize that information to make sound investment decisions that maximize wealth. And we'll start off with an example, and I got this out of a, a different textbook, but uh, the same kind of materials covered in the textbook I've assigned. Uh, we have a company here, Global Wireless, worldwide provider of wireless telephones, and they're contemplating a major expansion of their network in two different regions, Western Europe and or the Southeast U.S. So here's the projection of cash flows in millions for the Western Europe expansion. It's going to cost $250 million. You know, They have to build more infrastructure, put up more towers and that kind of thing, but run more wires. But then they're contemplating that that's going to get them more subscribers and more customers, and that's going to have a payoff trend that uh, increases over time as they get more market penetration. So 35 million in the first year, then 80 million in the second, 130 in the third, 160 in the fourth, 175 in the fifth year. And we'll chart these cash flows in this fashion here. And you'll notice here in a minute, I'll jump into Excel to show how we calculate this easily. This is exactly how we'll set it up in Excel. The initial outlay and then the periodic cash flows just like this. Here's the same story for the Southeast United States. It's a much smaller project. It only requires a $50 million initial investment. And then it's going to generate smaller returns. They're also going to grow because the idea here is that as you get more market penetration, more market share, you get more income. But notice that only starts at 18 in the first year. And then by the fifth year, it only grows to 32 million. So a much smaller project. But depending on how these things play out, uh, one of the smaller project could actually be the better project. It just depends on what, whether it passes the tests that we're going to apply or not. So the first of those tests, or the first of our capital budgeting decision methods, is the payback period. This is simply the amount of time required for the firm to recover its initial investment. And what we'll do is compare that against a benchmark. And we'll say if the project's payback period is less than the, the benchmark, the maximum we've decided we're, that we'll accept, then we'll go ahead with the project. 
If not, then we'll go ahead and reject the project. The trick of payback period is determining what the proper benchmark or cutoff is. Two years, three years, five years, kind of depends on how impatient your management is, what the expectations of the board of directors and shareholders are, and, and things of that nature. So let's just presume for our global wireless example case that the payback time, the cutoff time, is 2.75 years. Uh, the Western Europe project, we have to recover the outflow of 250 million. Over the first three years, we only get 245 million back. That's right here, 35 plus 80 is 115, plus 130 is 245. So we don't get the $250 million back within three years, much less 2.75 years. So in this payback stipulation, we're going to go ahead and reject that project. The other project, the Southeast US project, we have to get back a $50 million outflow. And we do indeed recover that within 2.4 years, so less than 2.75 years. Uh, the, re the reason we say 2.4 years is because the the year three cash flow is positive 25 million and we only needed uh, we got 40 million in the first two years so we only needed 10 more million so it's 10 25ths which works out to 0.4 so we get all the money back in 2.4 years so that is less than the cutoff or the threshold so we'll go ahead and accept that project we're going to reject that project per this particular payback threshold and accept this one now, let's just look back to the total cash flows and you know the Western Europe project generates a lot of cash especially in the later years and we're just we're gonna reject it because of this arbitrary 2.75 year payback period and th this project I mean this is nice but it's not generating nearly as much cash as this one and we're saying yes to this one and no to this one uh, because of the payback cutoff period now well, that doesn't smell right Okay, so so while the payback method is really easy, easy to understand and, and easy to demonstrate to people, it actually isn't a very good method because it's pretty arbitrary. And there's some other problems too. It doesn't account for time value of money at all. We didn't discount those future uh, payments. And you know, that really does make a difference even if we're only two, three, four years out. There, there's some discounting factors that are going to significantly reduce the present value. Doesn't account for risk because we're not uh, utilizing a discount rate, which we could adjust up or down depending on the perceived riskiness of the investment. And the biggest problem, which I've been uh, addressing, is the arbitrariness of the cutoff period. And so payback really doesn't lead to value maximizing decision. What it is is a um, a really easy and simple rule of thumb for people who, for some reason, aren't willing to engage in the more sophisticated financial analysis. Now more sophisticated doesn't mean it's necessarily that much harder to do because you know we have Excel and Excel can do the math for us so Excel can make things really easy. Okay so let's find a better capital budgeting method and one of the most widely used methods is the net present value method in PV. Net present value is the sum of the present values of all of the projects cash inflows and outflows. And as I'll show you here in a minute, Excel makes this devilishly uh, easy to calculate. When we discount, we account for time value of money, which as we've discussed is very important. And then we could adjust the discount rate we use to correctly incorporate the riskiness of the project. Remember the risk re reward trade-off. More risk, higher return, that means we, we set a higher discount rate. So we can think about that in this sense. When risk goes up, reward goes up with it, and that implies a higher discount rate. So a highly risky project, you know, we might set a discount rate something like 15 or even 20 percent, whereas with a low risk project, you know, we, we, we have a much lower benchmark. You know, treasury bonds are a risk-free investment, and they currently pay 3 percent, so a low risk project, we might factor that discount rate at something pretty low like 5%. Okay. And then the nice thing about Excel is we can do sensitivity analysis and we can just uh, create multiple scenarios and, and mess around with these rates and kind of size up a whole bunch of different possible outcomes. So here's how NPV works. It should look very familiar by now. Simply the um, sum of the present values of all the cash flows from periods 1 through N. This uh, kind of nomenclature is familiar to us by now. The f cash flow in the first year, second year, third year, dot, 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 through the nth year for however many years there are in the project. And we're also adding, and this is to often going to be subtracting because this is uh, often the initial outlay, the initial expense. So that'll often be subtracted. 
And then the test will be to see whether we have a positive net present value or not. In other words, if the sum of all the future cash inflows of this project is greater than the initial cost, well, that means the project's going to generate some return for us, except projects if NPV is greater than zero. That's the basic rule. Now, we'll get a little bit more nuanced on that here in a minute. Okay, so here's the equation again, and we want to point out that a key input is the discount rate. Discount rate always pops up when we're discounting, when we're calculating present values. That rate represents the minimum return to the project must earn to satisfy investors. We've talked a little bit about this before, and we'll, we should talk some more about it now because we really want to understand where does this come from. Well, as I've mentioned, it, it's a judgment call. We have to decide where to set that rate based on the risk profile of the investment project. A good way to think about where that R, that uh, discount rate, needs to come from is an idea known as the opportunity cost of capital, sometimes abbreviated OCC. The idea with the opportunity cost, which you might remember from your econ classes, is this is the next best alternative we could have undertaken with our time, with our resources, with our money. So I'm always looking at the investments I could go and just buy and hold and not have to manage, passive investments. And if I'm looking for a low risk, short term passive investment, I could just go into the bond market, I could buy treasury bonds or treasury bills You know, with, um, with T notes right now in fall 2017, I can earn about 2.3 percent 10-year treasury notes for treasury bonds 30-year I can earn I think it's about 3 percent right now okay and that's a sure thing on those treasury bonds remember what Alan Greenspan said government can print money to pay that back so that nominal yield is a sure thing that's known as the risk-free rate of return if I'm looking at uh, investment project w within my company that's ultra safe it's gonna have to pay at least this much and I might want to dial the rate up a little bit more just to make it worth my while you know to, to have a, a, a real differential in the return okay so so that would be the absolute minimum now we're looking at more risky projects and, and probably more long-term projects and especially than T notes and we might be looking at projects that, that go for years and years and we're, we're thinking about maybe uh, equity markets stock markets and what's a good measurement of their average return while well, the nominal average return of stocks in the US for the past hundred plus years is something like 12 percent so what that tells me is I can get a nominal 12 percent return on my money if I just go stick it into the stock market now that's highly volatile you know much higher risk and that's why this return is higher because some years I can go down I could even go down for a couple years in a row sometimes but other years the stock market is going gangbusters and you get 20 to 30 percent return and in a long run in a 10 20 30 year period those ups and downs will even out and you'll get a very healthy positive double digit return so you're thinking about these kind of alternatives, you know, low, low risk up here. You know, that, that's kind of the floor of your low risk opportunities, your government bonds. You're thinking about high risk right here. And this uh, is probably the kind of the floor for your higher risk opportunities because when you get into the more spe specific kind of investments, you want to do better than the stock market. You might, you might want to do several points better than the stock market to justify the fact that those specific investments are going to be even riskier. So this is always going to be up to the individual company to decide what is their actual opportunity cost what is their actual threshold that they need to exceed in order for this investment to be better than other investments what we're going for in investing and in, in financial management and capital budgeting is not just a positive rate of return it's it's not just a positive return because anybody can get a positive return right here by just plunking money down in the in treasury bills and forgetting about it or plunking money down in broad market index mutual fund and forgetting about it. So what we need is a above opportunity cost rate of return. We might say at or at slash above opportunity cost rate of return. So with the more high risk kind of investments that businesses undertake, equity finance businesses undertake, you know, we might be looking at discount rates in the 12 to 20 percent range. And that sounds like fantastic rates of return. Well, and it is because uh, one thing we have to also realize is that many of these investments will fail. So if we if we run 10 projects and two out of the 10 fail, even if they all average 15% return, the fact that two of them fail and maybe actually lost money, that's going to pull that average return down. So the, the riskiness justifies the higher discount rate. Remember, it's all about that risk return trade-off. 
fundamental principle of finance and it's you know something we have to live by higher risk higher return lower risk lower return okay so let's run the NPV analysis for the global wireless uh, example case assuming global wireless uses an 18 percent discount rate and that's in line here with uh, the kind of numbers we were just talking about Western Europe project has an NPV of 75.3 million there's the math now I'm gonna show you this in Excel here uh, in just a second so sit tight and the Southeast US project has an NPV of 25.7 million so which one should we do well if we've got the money we should do both of them huh that's always gonna be the question do we have that much money can we raise that much capital let's jump into Excel and I'll show you I've got this uh, global wireless situation set up here and I just want to briefly give you a rundown of how to do NPV it's very easy in Excel it's actually easier than uh, valuing bonds and stocks so I've got the uh, setup of the let's look at the uh, project one which was the Western Europe expansion our initial outlay is 250 million I've got that as a negative and then this is the income stream just copied it over from the slides our discount rate and watch how easy it is to do net present value in Excel it's a function equals in PV you start with the rate I'm just gonna plug that in cell reference and then you do the values that you're discounting so these are the values not the initial value but the values that occur into the, into the future so year one through year five incomes and that gives us present value of the cash inflows of 325 million then I have to take that and subtract and I'm gonna add because this is a negative number the initial outlay so my net result I'll highlight it here is 75.26 million and indeed that agrees with what we got here in the slide likewise for the uh, southeast US project okay I've got my rate here so I can just run my NPV on that rate and then these cash inflow values that occur into the future and then I'm going to combine that with the initial outlay to wind up with my net net result of 25.73 million which is what we got right here so should global wireless invest in one project or both I've said well both if they've got the money now here's a little bit more nuanced way to think about that assume the firm's stock price is currently uh, trading at forty dollars and the discount rate that we're applying to that is 10 percent that means the market's expecting a 10 percent return or four dollar dividends if we have a net present value greater than zero that means the project's return is going to be greater than 10 percent we can pay higher than four dollars in dividends and the stock price is going to go up accordingly with the higher dividend remember from last time we talked about bonds and also dividend paying stocks the present value is based on a discounted cash flow of the dividend stream or the, the coupon stream so if we can bump up the dividends the stock price will rise accordingly and that's the goal of a lot of corporations they want to increase shareholder wealth on the other hand if the net present value is less than zero the project's return is going to be less than 10 percent now remember it could still be positive this is why I emphasize the point that we're not going for positive we're going for above threshold or above opportunity cost because even if the return is eight percent you might think oh that eight percent that's nice you know I can only get one percent in my bank account or three percent on my treasury bonds well what happens the markets expecting ten percent and if we get eight percent we're failing we got less than what the market was expecting so the projects return is less than ten the dividends go down because of that and the stock price goes down because of that so uh, positive return that is not equal to or greater than our threshold uh, opportunity cost discount rate is not going to cut the mustard so that's why that discount rate that that choice of discount rate is so so important here okay now pros and cons of NPV uh, mostly pros this book refers to NPV as the gold standard of investment decision rules it is it's really the go-to it's it's kind of the most sophisticated uh, most informative one it gives you focus on uh, cash flows which is what we care about in, in finance not not accounting earnings because accounting earnings we have to adjust those to get to cash flows and cash flows are what we pay dividends with cash flows are what we pay interest with so the cash flow focus is great the appropriate adjustment for time value of money because we're discounting yeah right? PV stands for present value and then we can account for risk differences between projects by changing RR by appropriately setting our discount rate there are some drawbacks it's a little harder to understand than something simple like payback period and it doesn't capture uh, managerial flexibility well uh, I, I think that's a pretty minor problem I think net present value is going to uh, work pretty well for us in any situation okay now on a closely related note to net present value is a, a concept of internal rate of return 
Internal rate of return is simply the discount rate that results in a zero net present value for a project. So the way we find the internal rate of return is we set net present value to zero and then solve for R in the discounted cash flow net present value problem. And that math would be a little tricky, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be some algebra. But once again, Excel can do that for us very easily. So in a minute here, I'll show you how to do this in Excel as well. The decision rule for IRR is that if IRR is greater than the cost of capital, accept the project. In other words, if the internal rate of return is above our, I like to call it a threshold. Uh, some books call it a hurdle rate or opportunity cost of capital. If the IRR is greater than that, well, that means we're, we're beating the market expectation and therefore that project's a win. If we're not above that, remember, yield on this investment could be positive, but if it's not positive enough, if it's not above expectations or opportunity costs, then it's a no-go. Now, an interesting way to think about net present value is to plot the change in net present value with changes in the, uh, the discount rate, or th this book refers to it as a hurdle rate. What's going on here is the, the net present value is on the vertical scale, and it's, it's getting higher as we go up, lower as we go down. In fact, it's going to be negative down here, positive up here. And then on the x-axis, we have the, the R, the discount rate. And what happens as discount rate goes up, what happens to present values? They go down, right? That's a Bocephus principle. As interest rates up, stock market's down. Interest rates up, asset values down. So as interest rates rise here, present values fall. And there's going to be an interest rate where the net present value is zero. And that is the IRR. So basically the idea here, as long as the IRR is above the hurdle rate, our net present value is positive, the project increases shareholder wealth. So basically, we're going to do any project that lies in this range right here. We're going to keep doing projects up until we zero out the IRR right there. And beyond that, net present value is negative. So basically, this is a rejection re region. We're going to say no to projects that fall in here. And this is an acceptance region. We're going to say yes to projects that fall in here. And by setting net present value to zero, what we're basically doing is forcing the, the uh, IRR to this point to the kind of the cutoff point, and there, then we can compare the IRR to our threshold rate or our hurdle rate and kind of make an easy decision. If we run our calculation, we find that IRR equals on the project equals 9%, when our, our threshold or our hurdle rate equals 12%, that would be our opportunity cost of capital, by the way. Well, then we can say, oh, 9 is less than 12, so that project's a no-go. We run it for another project. We see that the IRR is 15% equals 15%. Compare that to the hurdle rate. Ah, oh, that's bigger than the hurdle rate, so that project's a net winner. So we say yes to that project. So that's how IRR works. It's, it's really a, a complement to net present value. It's not, it's not something different. So let's do the IRR analysis for the global wireless situation. Their discount rate, remember, their threshold, their hurdle rate was 18%. So we're going to establish the net present value at zero and then solve for the R and doing that I'll show you how we can run this calculation in Excel here in a second but that's gonna work out to uh, 28 percent does that look good yeah it's uh, 10 points above the IRR so that is a that's a win that is really beating the the uh, discount rate the one for the southeast US wow look at that IRR you know, we, we set the net present value to zero again solve for the R and we're gonna get a 36.7 so that one's also a winner way above the required rate. Once again, and notice that this is agreeing with net present value analysis, both of them had a positive net present value, both of them are therefore going to have an IRR that exceeds the threshold or hurdle rate, so they're both going to be a go. The question is only can we afford to run both of them? Can we come up with the capital? Okay, now let's go ahead and jump into Excel and, and work the IRR. This is very simple. I've got the same sequence of cash flows for my initial outlay, which is negative, and then my income stream year one through five. And the way we calculate IRR, uh, you want to guess what the function is? That's right. It's just equals IRR. And now the, there's a little bit of a difference between this and NPV. Here we start with the initial outlay. So we just insert those values from the initial outlay to the final cash flow. And it's asking for a guess here, but I think we can just uh, let it rip. Yeah, and we'll get 28%. Go back and check against the slide. Yep, 27.8%. Okay, that's exactly the same. And then for the other project, Southeast US, again, just equals IRR, plug in the values, and hit enter. Let it rip, 37%. We want to be a little more precise. 
36.7. So we got exactly what we got there in the slides. Excel did a uh, kind of complicated math for us very, very easily with its functions. So we'll do more of that in the homework tutorial, but that just gives you an idea. It's, it's, not, that, it's not that difficult. You just know how to set the problem up, know what functions to use. Okay, now let's think about some pros and cons of IRR. Advantages are related to the advantages of a net present value. Properly adjusts for time value of money, so I like that. Uses cash flows rather than earnings. Remember, earnings, uh, you know, they, they, there's non-cash components in there. Like we're reducing that by de depreciation. So we don't like that from a finance perspective. From a finance perspective, we prefer cash flows. So that's good. Accounts for all cash flows, uh, not just the ones within a payback period. And the IRR is an intu it's intuitive. You know, we can look at that rate of return and we could kind of side by side compare that to other projects and our threshold rate. And if it's larger or smaller, you know, it, it's obvious what that means. Disadvantages, there's some kind of some quirky little things that happen with the, with the math. Sometimes you get multiple IRRs, no real solution. And that, that happens if you have uh, cash flows that alternate between positive and negative. There's, there's some timing problems where IRRs will disagree with NPV if you have heavily front or, or end loaded cash flow sequences. So IRR doesn't work perfectly all the time. I'll just uh, briefly address this issue of the scale problem. And this is the fact that we, we uh, actually calculated both of these. For the example company, Global Wireless, the um, IRR was higher for the Southeast US project, but the net present value was higher for the Western Europe project. Well, hmm, which one should we go with? Right? If we can only afford one project, um, should we go for the one with the higher return? percentage-wise or the higher cash flow dollar-wise? Anybody got a guess there? If you guessed cash flow, you're right. Uh, this is going to create more value for the shareholders, even though the rate of return is slightly smaller. And here, we've got to be a little careful here. You know, then I think um, the, our book says, would you rather earn a 100% return on a $5 investment, which is a uh, net return of $5, or a 20% return on a $1,000 investment. Well, you can do that in your head really quick. That's 200 bucks. Okay. So in this case, I'd rather earn 20% even though the rate of return's lower because the payoff is much higher. This is a negligible payoff. That's a nice payoff. So in that sense, NPV does kind of trump there if there's a, a disagreement between NPV and IRR. And what's going on there? Well, the scale of the Europe project is five times the US project. And so even though there's a higher return on the, on the US project, that scale, that much larger scale of the Europe project gives that much bigger increase in present value and net earnings. Okay, so we've looked at methods to generate and analyze uh, long-term investment proposals, payback period, net present value, and internal rate of return. And now we are ready to tackle some homework problems, uh, putting these techniques into practice in Excel.